listening to Guitar Goddess Radio with Azina, only on L.A. Talk Radio. Hello and welcome to Guitar Goddess. Today we have an incredible guest for you today. We have Lo Carmen in the studio. And Lo Carmen will be talking to us about her latest release, Lovers, Dreamers, and Fighters, which that title is so appropriate right now, how she got started, and, and what's happening with her music. So, Lo Carmen, welcome to the show. Hi, Zena. Thanks. It's so great to have you here. I'm just so psyched to, to dig in here and talk a little bit more about you and what's happening in your world. All right, let's go. Yeah, so... <laughs> <laughs> Well, you're working on this new record, Lovers, Dreamers, and Fighters, and mm -hmm. this is your... Uh, well, it's my sixth solo Your sixth album. solo mm -hmm. album. Wow. And it's just so fun to listen to. You know, you sent over a few tracks for us to, to check out, and I went to your website, uh -huh. and I was digging around and digging what you're doing. So how did you get started? Well, uh, my dad is a musician, yes. so I just was kind of always at gigs and around gigs and kind of just always a part of it and then I started my first band I think I was about 20 and it was a 12 piece country and western band my dad got all of his friends to come and play <laughs> wait a country and western band in Australia okay yes. <laughs> how did that go over <laughs> Finally, <laughs> it's one of the most popular bands I've ever had. Really? Yeah. That's so cool. And I've had a lot. Yeah, we strangely, we um, we kind of got, you know, asked to go on television and, and do appearances, etc. quite quickly, but it all, it all combusted quite quickly as well. It was a lot of people in one band. How big was the band? <laughs> There's 12 of us. Oh, my gosh. So yeah. You had, like, fiddle players and... Yeah, we had six musicians and, and six revolving singers. So we'd sometimes sing duets, sometimes all six of us would be on stage. It was a mixture of original songs and covers of Dolly Parton and George Jones and Johnny Cash, etc., and, and how did you find <laughs> out about, like, I, I just find this so fascinating. Like, for whatever reason, I just feel like country is such a so Americana, American. you know. How did you find country music in Australia? Well, was it through my your dad, dad had a country rock band. Okay, got it. Okay. And then um, I guess I just always, I liked the albums that I'd find in thrift stores that had, you know, the ladies in the fantastic dresses on the front yeah. and then I'd bring them home and listen to them and that's how I discovered people like Dolly Parton and Loretta Lynn and I just became very obsessed as teenagers do and uh, wanted to do that for myself. <laughs> that's so cool and traveling around with such a big band like uh, just the idea of that oh. like almost gave me a headache. Well, it was because prior <laughs> my mobile phone so you can imagine organizing um, rehearsals was it was a nightmare. Oh, yeah. It's like herding <laughs> cats when you have yeah. that many musicians. Yeah. It's so <laughs> difficult. <laughs> anyway. And so, you know, as a kid, you know, one of your stories on your website, you talk about, like, being under the piano while your dad is, like, performing. Mm -hmm. You know, th that must have been really cool, like, to, as a kid, like, always be surrounded by music. It was. And uh, it makes me a bit sad that there's not more of that today. Like, it was just very natural for there always to be kids wherever bands were playing. Mm -hmm. I guess there was a lot of Sunday afternoon gigs, but it, it just didn't seem to be a problem. Whereas now, you know, I've got two little boys and they have only seen me play once. Wow. Yes. Uh, Is that because most of the places are over 21? Yeah, most yeah. of the places I yeah. play are nightclubs, so they just never, there's n not an opportunity yeah. for them to play. When uh, my son got asked what I did as a job at school, everyone had to talk about what their parents did. He said, she rehearses. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I love that. Yes, there's a lot of rehearsing that happens. I didn't know whether to laugh or cry. Right, right. It's like, oh, my gosh. He, he says That's she, it. Huh? <laughs> that's it. I don't do anything. I don't write songs. I don't tour. I just rehearse. Yeah. So <laughs> that's Pretty much cute. summed it up, really. <laughs> but, you know, it's always your kids, though, that, like, really doesn't appreciate what you do until yes. older. Well, actually, as I was t telling you before, my records arrived right. last night, right. late last night, and uh, the kids were so excited because I think it was the first kind of real thing that they had been witness to, like the record arriving and being able to put it on the turntable and put headphones on and listen. They were really excited. 
I love that. Maybe not as excited as me, but. <laughs> <laughs> but it's cool because it's like to them, there's like, oh, she's rehearsing, you know, she's just rehearsing. It's yeah, just or she's on the doing, computer. Sh- yeah, know. she's on the computer. That's all she does. And then you got this physical manifestation of all of this work. Mm-hmm. And they're like, oh, oh, my mom's actually a rock star. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's kind of cool. <laughs> So going back to Australia and your band and, and doing country and Western, you know, how did that bring you to America? Well, that didn't bring me to America. Okay. Uh, my husband is an actor. So okay. our family came over here for some work that he was doing. And uh, the show he was working on was in Georgia. Oh. So we ended up living kind of half the year in Georgia for the past four years, which was absolutely beautiful I really loved it um, we all did we all really miss Georgia and wonder about going back all the time but um, I've forgotten the question now how did we get here <laughs> yes <laughs> That's how, how did, we, got how did here. we bring the country from Australia to America That's how we got <laughs> here. and uh, you know my geography skills are pretty terrible but once I realized that Nashville was only a short five-hour drive from Georgia I was in that car as often as I could <laughs> heading off to Nashville to record yeah you know, that's just, I guess, what, what my dreams have always been, to go there and record and just breathe that Nashville air. Um, I know that any Nashvilleians would just laugh at me, but... Uh, no, <laughs> they understand. I, yeah. I guess they do, actually. Yeah, you know, Nashville yeah. is such a special place, especially for songwriters and especially, you know, for country music. It's just such a mecca. There's so much going on. And, you know, every yeah. songwriter that I know wants to spend time in Nashville yeah because the community there the yes to to feel that you're somewhere where music is so valued I think Mm -hmm. is really amazing Mm -hmm. Australia has a lot of incredible musicians and a wonderful music scene but in general it's a bit of a cultural wasteland Mm. uh, in terms of support for the arts it's kind of seen as I guess not really a profession. <laughs> like frivolous. Yeah. Well, that's how it is here, too. <laughs> <laughs> I guess yeah. it is a bit frivolous. Yeah. yeah, unless you're in one of those little hotbeds like Nashville or Austin or, you know, y- you just really feel that way. Yeah. You know, in LA. Like get a real job. Yeah, you know? right, right, right. <laughs> you know, LA, we have those pockets where, you know, you have really deep music communities, but I think it's really important to find them. And I'm so excited that you did, you know, communicate, you know, or not communicate, that you were able to find a community in yeah. Nashville and, and you worked um, with some producers there. Um, you know, tell us about working at the cash. Oh, well, uh, through one of the actors on my husband's show, mm-hmm. I, I got put onto this lovely man called David Ferguson, who uh, was Johnny Cash's engineer. He did all of those great American recordings. He kind of I think was very instrumental in helping to convince him to go away from the more syrupy kind of stuff that he was leaning towards Mm -hmm. in later years and just strip everything right back. And um, so I went and recorded a little solo EP with him with a guitar that I bought in a Goodwill in Georgia for $4.95. $4.95. I <laughs> love that. Those I are the best too. finds, aren't well, they? Yeah, and actually I think it was an old Stella parlor guitar. Uh, the name is scratched off, mm-hmm. but I think that's what it is. Anyway, it's got a kind of great old banjo type sound. And just to be recording with him in his little studio and knowing that Johnny Cash had sat on the other side of that glass, yeah, yeah. you know, along with a lot of other incredible people. Uh, it was just a wonderful, very inspiring feeling, I guess. He's just such a cool, laid-back dude. He d- doesn't really say much. or <laughs> 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 But you can just tell when, when it works well, it's, uh, it's very exciting. And also John Prine recorded there. Oh, who's, wow. You know, I'm a major fan of. He, n- he, in fact, co-owned the studio. So just all of that history, I felt like it was you know, going through my feet. And Absolutely, and coming out of your mouth yeah. in the songs, for sure. <laughs> now, were you writing as well at the time, or were you... Yeah, I wrote a bunch of songs in Georgia. In the, in the both in Georgia. times, okay. both with the little EP that I did just by myself mm-hmm. and for the album that I recorded there with the amazing Nashville musicians. That's so cool. And what is... Tell us a little bit. You're talking about, you know, Nashville, which is... You all know, like, that's just a huge songwriting mecca. 
you know, and, and I love talking to songwriters such as yourself and just learning about your process, you know, of, of bringing your songs together because everybody kind of has their own, their own style mm -hmm. of uh, bringing songs together. So tell us a little bit about your songwriting process. Uh, well, generally, I just, I generally make notes all the time. I've got, you know, notebooks in my purse, <laughs> <laughs> scraps of paper, etc. And then I wait until I have time and sit there and try and put it all together. I like to find a starting point, I guess, and then just close my eyes and play and sing, record it, and kind of condense it down from there. Um, I generally find that if I say a lot more than I need to, then I can cut a lot out mm -hmm. and get it a lot more concise. I can be too wordy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm guilty of that as well. <laughs> I'm so guilty of that as well as being too wordy. I mean, some of my songs, I when you make those lyric sheets, I'm like, oh, wow, this is really long. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, it, but the thing is, you're a storyteller. So as a storyteller, you have to be wordy. You got to tell the story. And that's, that's right. what I love about country music is that it's more focused around the story than that's just true. a hook. Yes. You know, and so I love that storytelling. I do too. And I've, I've never been one just for, you know, don't bore us, get to the chorus. Mm -hmm. Although <laughs> I can appreciate that. Right, right, right. <laughs> right. There is a time and place for that. Like there in the is. club, of course, I want a hook, you know, because yeah. you're dancing, you want to yeah. dance. But, you know, um, country music, tell me a good story, you know, and I love it. I love it because I can paint the picture of my mind of what you're talking about. That's right. I like to write a song that if you close your eyes and listen to it, you can apply it to something that you know. I like to keep it a little bit obscure sometimes. Yeah. So that, um, but interestingly, I do find that the more personal your lyrics are, even if you're not um, totally revealing what's going on, the more people can uh, react to it and feel it for themselves, put Absolutely. themselves in that position. Now, who are some of your favorite songwriters? Who do you, whose music do you love? <laughs> oh gosh, where do we begin? <laughs> yes, <laughs> let's start. <laughs> wow, wow. <laughs> Those first records you found in the thrift stores in in, in Australia. Oh look, the, the holy trilogy of Dolly Parton. Oh my Loretta gosh, I Lynn, love her. Tammy Wynette. I oh. mean, that's pretty much who I obsef obsessively listen to nonstop. Um, and kind of, I guess from there, I got into the men folk. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. This is the guitar goddess yeah. show. We're talking about the goddesses first. That's right. <laughs> it's all the ladies. Yes. Uh, but I guess I started hearing their duet partners, oh. like, you know, Porter Wagner and George Jones. But also at the same time, um, you know, all of my friends were into things like you know, Nick Cave and, you know, stuff that was very although that's all comes from country as well yeah, really yeah um but i guess i've always had a pretty wide reaching appreciation of, of music um any anyone with great lyrics i love there's so many modern people now like father john misty mm -hmm. daniel romano hayes carl lots of great singer-songwriters that I'm really enjoying listening to. Laurie McKenna, I oh, love. She was a guest of the show. I listened to that show. Oh, yeah, I love her. wonderful. <laughs> I love her, too. She's such a beautiful lyricist. Yes. I find her very inspiring. I love the way that she can just take the domestic and elevate it into something so soulful. Absolutely, absolutely. It's so funny. I loved when I interviewed her, her son was like sitting next to us and he was acting as her tour manager. Mm -hmm. And he's just so adorable. I think he was 20 at the time. And, um, you know, she was telling all these stories about her husband. And I said, how does he feel about being? <laughs> <laughs> and put she's on, like, he's used to chart. it now. Yeah, he's totally used to it now. And, I, you know, that type of music, you just got to get get used to it, you know. And That's I want to. I want to uh, take a break and listen to your music. We have a song here called Sometimes It's Hard. <laughs> <laughs> this one has got uh, Bonnie Prince Billy singing with me, who's okay. probably my number one favorite singer-songwriter. And so tell us about the song. Uh, well, I guess it's kind of a, a domestic universal song. It's, okay. it's 
just saying sometimes it's hard. <laughs> <laughs> but, <laughs> but hang in there. But hang in there. It, it'll become clear. You know, and this is so appropriate for the times we're going through right now. You know, there's a lot of uh, things going on in the world, not to get political, but there's a lot of things going on in the world, and we need these songs. And I think it's why so many people are really... Um, clinging on to country music right now because those stories are really heartfelt and really, you know, giving people hope and inspiration, Yeah, you know, to continue. So we are going to listen to Sometimes It's Hard by Lil' Carmen. <laughs> Sometimes it's hard. Sometimes it sure is. Oh, 
<laughs> I love it. I love it. We need more of these songs. <laughs> that was really beautiful. And had you worked with Bonnie Billy Prince B or Prince <laughs> Billy before? No, no, I had, no. I had not. That was a, a fortuitous Nashville connection. Really? Mm. Did you guys meet like in a songwriter circle or something? No, no, no. Uh, it was all organized oh, through the studio. Cool. They, they were friends. That's yeah. very cool. Yeah. I love that. It was great. I love that. And you write like songs I, I love your stories in your in your songs and we were just talking about you said you wrote a song for your husband <laughs> <laughs> I did I love when singers do that I love that so much because it's so fun and I love to see the guys look on their face you know I not that I've been in the room except for with my own husband and he was like what but <laughs> <laughs> what, what? <laughs> you gonna put my what? business in the street like that <laughs> so you yeah. wrote a song for your husband I wrote one for my husband called who told you butter was evil because because <laughs> <laughs> he is a, uh, you know, heavy smoking, drinking, steak eating kind of guy. And I'm a vegetarian, couple of white wines, you know, yeah. <laughs> kind of girl. But every time I put butter on my toast, he'd be standing behind me going, oh, butter, that stuff will kill you. What are you doing? You've got to give the butter up. <laughs> so <laughs> of all things to of give all up, things butter. To worry about in this world. Butter is his bugbear. So <laughs> I, uh, I wrote him a song called "Who Told You Butter Was Evil." <laughs> I love it. Can we? I know we can't hear it today, but I want to hear. Send it to yes, you. please send it. I would love to put it in our play our uh, playlist. All right. Because that's really fun. <laughs> well, I actually, I wrote it in Georgia because you know butter is very popular in Georgia. Oh, for sure. So. It kind of seemed like the right place to write a song <laughs> like that. <laughs> I'm sure th that the local charts, that would be number one. That's right. <laughs> I thought about taking out a billboard for that. You should. You should. That would be awesome. <laughs> you know, send it over to Miss Paula Dean. Hello. That's right. <laughs> Butter is not evil. Keep going. Keep doing what you're doing. <laughs> So, you know, we have a lot of girls that like write in and they want, you know, advice on, on getting started. Mm -hmm. And I love, love, love. I think the youngest girl in our community is like nine years old. Oh. And I mostly communicate with her mom. But we have younger girls and they always write in and they have like the cutest, cutest questions about how to get started and, you know, picking out guitars and playing their first open mics and stuff like that. Like, That's so cool. Cool. Isn't it cool? I love like it. I'm like, yes, the young generation of women are still playing and still sharing their stories. So I would love for you to, you know, tell us what would be your advice for some of the younger girls that are coming up? Well, I think that the best thing that you can know is that you can do everything yourself, especially these days. You don't have to be discovered. You don't have to have anybody else give you any kind of validation. Uh, the internet is full of unbelievable tools for releasing your own music, for promoting your own music. Um, you just have to be savvy with spending time researching and learning how to do these things properly. And you know, you got it all going on yourself. Um, that's, that's the business side. Musically, though, I feel the same. I feel like a, a lot of people spend time, you know, worrying about what other people think or needing somebody to tell them that it, their song is all right or that they're playing all right. I think just play until something feels great to you and just follow that as far as you can. I have a six-year-old goddaughter who... Um, loves nothing more than to sing into a microphone with she's got a little pink mini fender electric guitar that she doesn't really know how to play but she just bashes away making sounds making up words and they're the most beautiful little songs i've ever heard wow <laughs> yeah that's awesome it is awesome i just watch her do that and think what are you going to be like by the time you're 18 years old I right can't wait <laughs> <laughs> that's very exciting you know and thank you so much for that i love so much that you said to not look for validation mm. to not look for validation because uh, that's a lot of what they're looking for yeah and nowadays it doesn't matter like you said it doesn't matter just get your music out there just get it out there yeah, i think the world is big enough Absolutely. But there's room for everyone. There's room for and everybody. if somebody doesn't like what you do, then that's fine. Let them like whatever they like, and you can go and find... There'll be a community somewhere that likes what you do. 
might be a small community, but <laughs> it's so true. There's fans for everyone. Yeah. You know, and uh, that's the wonderful thing about being alive right now. I think is that we have so much at our fingertips. Yes. You know, I mean, our phones. You know, years ago, it would have taken an entire room the size of this. I mean. A, this room would be full of like mainframes to do what our computers can do, what That's our phones right. can do, yeah. you know. So it's just a very connection and communication. Yes, yes, an amazing uh, tool and opportunity to have at our fingertips. And as much as I hate promoting the idea of somebody sitting on a phone or on a computer for hours on end, the things that you can achieve by doing that are pretty wonderful. It's so true. Finding your people. Exactly. Finding your people who love what you're doing and can connect. And, you know, that's why these music communities are so important. You know, like the Nashvilles and the Austins and the L.A.s of the world are so important because you just need to see other people. You yeah. know, it's wonderful on the Internet and we can see and find so much there. But it's also so wonderful just to connect. And I'm so grateful that we're connecting today. Me too. Yeah, it's just really great information. And, and um, you know, thank you for sharing that with the young girls out there. And I just want to ask you, you know, a little bit about guitars, because I think that it's very intimidating sometimes for women when it comes to going and picking out their guitars. Mm -hmm. And I love that earlier you said you picked up a guitar in a thrift store for $4.95. Like, mm -hmm. that's what it's all about. <laughs> <laughs> no yeah. disrespect to the high-end guitars because I have many of them, but yeah. you know, it's just about starting and getting out there. You Look, know, yeah, I just needed something to kind of get me through. Yeah, and yeah. I was just lucky enough that it was a kind of cool, weird-sounding guitar. Yeah. So I tend to like old guitars. Old guitars. Yeah. That's what you tend to like most. I like guitars with a bit of personality. I'm intimidated by those expensive, the really high end, yeah. super glossy, yeah. shiny, like you don't want to drop it kind of guitars. That's right. <laughs> I've always been really lucky in that I've had people, um, you know, give me long term loans of their guitars when they move overseas or whatever. So I never really made that big investment in getting my own guitar until recently when I bought a. Uh, telecast a thin line down on Sunset Boulevard in a nice <laughs> <laughs> in a porn store <laughs> Th that is the I hope best I'm saying that right I think I say it no uh, it's totally fine pawn store pawn shop it's all the same okay. but it's really funny because Sunset Boulevard those guys on they make so much money because you'll go to like the big name stores I'm not going to say them but you'll go to the big name stores and you go oh the guitar's four thousand dollars and then you'll go over to a pawn shop and it's like give me 150 yeah. you know <laughs> <laughs> I know I don't like to buy into that whole uh, kind of nasty world where God knows where the guitars come from, but sometimes you got to do what you got to do. Yes, exactly. And it's a beautiful guitar. That's <laughs> awesome. That's it's got awesome. a nice kind of vibe to it. Yeah. Very, very playable. And Keith Richards played one. Absolutely. And so there you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's, I, I don't know a lot about guitars, but my research indicated that whatever Keith played was going to be a good thing for Absolutely. me to play. Absolutely. You know, that's really cool because uh, sometimes I think that's the most intimidating thing to getting started playing guitar because you go into the store and there's a sea of guitars and it's like, where do I even start? Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes you just start at the pawn shop you know? <laughs> yes. and work your way from there. And what kind of uh, amp do you use, by the way? Uh, I used a Music Man in Australia, which okay. um, is great. It's got little, you know, reverb mm -hmm. um, pots on it. But... Here, I just have one of those little teeny tiny $20 Dan Electros because I just play at home. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I love it. I love it. That's really cool. So tell us a little bit about, you know, we talked about, excuse me, excuse me, you guys, I need water. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll keep it, you know, keep talking on the way. It's, <laughs> <laughs> it's funny, I talk so much, like I have to have water next to me. But anyways, um, you know, we talked about like, you know, cutting your teeth in different bands, you know, honky tonk. Um, you know, you've just kind of gone the gamut with this music, you know, performing in Europe, performing in America. Which do you like better, by the way? Do you like performing better in Europe or America? Oh, well, <laughs> in Europe, they feed you. Yes. Uh, you know, they make you feel pretty special in Europe. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I have to say, I can't go past that. Right. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> I love that. I know here, you know, it's so funny when I first started, when I first moved to L.A. years ago and I played the Sunset Strip, I was so excited. I thought 
thought I had arrived uh-huh. because I was playing the Sunset Strip. But after my set, you know, they throw your gear out on the sidewalk. And I was yeah, like, right. oh, this isn't glamorous <laughs> at all. Yeah. You know, I thought I was all thought everything. You were made in the shade. Yeah, yeah. I thought I had it together. And then my amps on the sidewalk. I'm like, dude, yeah. I don't even own that yet. I'm still paying on that. You know? yeah. <laughs> Are you still playing your last chord? And they're saying, can you pack your right, off and right, cut it off? Right, right. Well, no, they don't even ask you. You'll see these big bouncer looking dudes. And they come and they're like moving all your stuff on the stage. And you're like, <laughs> what is happening right now? You know? Yeah. So it is very. No, in re- Europe, they give you red wine and omelets. And I love you know. that red wine and omelets, you guys. For the entire band. What? It's amazing. And that's not part of your pay. No, that's <laughs> not part of your pay. <laughs> well, I'm hoping that you know we Crazy get past the things. the pay for play here in the states. Like, do you have that sort of thing in Australia where you have to pay to play the bigger rooms? Uh, no, you don't have to pay, but you'll quite frequently get paid incredibly poorly. You yeah, know. it's not unusual to do a you know, a gig where you end up being paid $25 or $50. Um, of course, there's a lot of musicians that will say, you don't do those gigs. That's letting the community down, you, which I get. But sometimes uh, you just want to play so bad you don't really care. <laughs> yeah, sometimes it's just a rehearsal. Like if you're going to pay for a rehearsal space, fine, they'll pay me 25 bucks to rehearse. You know, not that you want to do those often, but no. sometimes you just need to... Well, sometimes they're the great gigs, too. Like yeah. You know, that it's a great bar, and there'll be a lot of people, so what, they can't pay you better, I don't know, but um, sometimes it's just the way it is, you know. Yeah, you, yeah. You don't get into making music for your health or your bank account. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you you that's the thing about being an artist. You're an artist because you have to be. Yeah. You know, there's no it's other not choice. Really a choice. It's not a choice. Like no. it's in your genes oh and Oh gosh, I remember my dad getting a job once. <laughs> How did that work <laughs> out? <laughs> not very well. Not very well, right, right. <laughs> Everyone was like, "Wow, he's got a day job." I think it lasted about a month. But, you know, amazingly he's managed to support himself um, and a family. And a family for well over you know 60 years so that's pretty phenomenal bravo daddy that's yeah. awesome yeah that's awesome <laughs> yeah and what a great thing for you to see mm. you know what i mean like as an artist that like this can be done yeah because i think when you're younger you know i'm really speaking mostly to the younger community you know when you're still in grade school and you're thinking of this great idea that you're going to become a rock star and then you become 17, 18. And if you're not signed around that time, you start thinking, oh, God, what do I do? And then, you know, maybe there's people around you that are saying, maybe you need to give it up. You need to get a job. You need to do all these other things. Yeah. But as an artist, your soul just won't allow it. I think uh, if that's the case, then you have to be willing to, you know, do some gigs that are possibly not the greatest gigs, but at least you're playing Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. getting out and about i know plenty of people that will happily get a train for two hours to go and do a gig somewhere for a hundred bucks just to you know to be employed yeah yeah it's it's um really an interesting business that way (laughs) (laughs) it really really is you know just the things that we're willing to do i i had a girl on the show a couple weeks ago who um katie ferrara who's an amazing busker she Mm -hmm. makes money just going to like the different promenades and farmers markets and things and playing she probably makes a fortune she does you know she makes about five hundred dollars a day wow you know just playing putting her bucket out and playing music Mm -hmm. and you know it's like a full-time job for her she said she schedules it in and Mm -hmm. she you know goes at these certain times every week and she does it and you know and i was saying to her i did that once and i couldn't even bear to do it again because my head just wouldn't i couldn't put my head around busking But what an incredible way, you know, another way to, like, take control of your music career and get yourself out there. Totally. From that, she's gotten placements on TV shows and really? gigs and all that sort of thing. Amazing. That's great. Yeah, it's just really, really interesting. We all just kind of have to find our way. Yeah. Um, and I just want to talk about, like, the business end for you. Like, what advice would you have as far as the business end of setting up yourself as a musician? Because you've been quite successful. Well, I think that um, as boring as it is, you just have to spend a lot of time looking at what works. I look at other people's, um, not business models, but I I guess I just try and be 
smart and see what people that are have got a label or got big management are using what kind of tools mm -hmm. um, there's so many free things like you know linkio where in your bio and Instagram you can have links to all of your sites that kind of stuff mm -hmm. there's so much of it and it's free Spotify for artists um, a, 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 just a lot of stuff you can take advantage of but it's very time consuming and very tedious but if you don't do it, nobody's going to do it for you. Absolutely. And I'm always shocked by how many hours a day I can spend <laughs> working on my own, you know, tiddly little career. <laughs> and I think if I was with a record label, there's no way, even, you know, with Atlantic Records and a big deal, there's no way somebody's going to sit there for eight hours working on my internet stuff. It's true. And, you know, I was with a label many years ago. And I'm here to tell you, they don't do as much work as people think. No. Like, you know, it sounds wonderful to get a record deal. It sounds so exciting. And you think, oh, I can just practice all day. That's not how it rolls. No. <laughs> not even close. I mean, you have, you know, just like when you're working with a publicist, they have many different clients. You're working with the manager, they have many different clients. And you're just getting a tiny slice of their time because right. you're a piece Whereas of that. you're always going to be your own number one. Your own number one. <laughs> that is it. That is it. And I tend to just look at it in cycles now, like with yeah. an album, you know, that I give myself, you know, some months to write mm -hmm. and then some months to record and mix and then you go into the stage where it's just business for yeah. the next six months of just getting all the stuff done that it takes to put an album out and get it out into the world. And during that time, I've, I rarely even pick up a guitar. And then at the end of it, once the album's been out for a couple of months, you go, okay, now I can get back on with writing some new songs. Right. What am I going to do now? Right. I quite like that now. Yeah, it's, it's really cool when you can find your cycle, you know, mm. find your groove in it all, of it all because... It can be overwhelming. Mm -hmm. You know, social media is the thing that overwhelms me. Oh, me too. It's I mean, just so much. I partly can't stand it, partly enjoy it. Yeah, you know, exactly. It's wonderful being able to reach people all over the world at any time of the day or night. But sometimes it does feel overwhelming, like, what? I've got to be witty. And Everywhere, right. On it, and that just seems... And how do you do it? How do you keep it going? <laughs> <laughs> it does. It does. You know, it's like, okay, Instagram. Okay, here's a post on Instagram. Here's Twitter. Here's Facebook. Here's a Snapchat. You know, here's a, a Facebook Live. I here's even a YouTube gone Live. To a here's Snapchat a <laughs> or Facebook Live for all my talk of, hey, use the internet. <laughs> Snapchat? What's that? <laughs> it's the funny little faces. That's all I know. Right, right. Yeah, it's so funny. But yeah, it's just a lot to manage, and I just was curious about how you're keeping it going because you're s quite active. Oh well, that's good. Yeah, <laughs> I yeah. don't know. Every every couple of days, I put something up. Yeah, yeah. It's cool. <laughs> it's cool. Well, you know, you have this new record, "Lovers, Dreamers, Fighters," and uh, we're, I want to listen to another track from that album. All right. So you have um, you never learned to dance. Mm -hmm. What's the story behind that? Well. Hmm. <laughs> Actually, <laughs> there's kind of a funny story behind it because I um, <laughs> I joined the Nashville Songwriters Association just kind of out of interest mm -hmm. um, to see how everything worked. And I s sent this song in thinking, this is a really good song. Like, they're going to send me back a... They, s they send you... I can't even think what you call it. That when they write about a critique, yeah, yeah, I kind of expected I'd get a critique of, wow, this is a perfect song, and I got, you know, what is this? This <laughs> is just a list, like, you know, <laughs> they just doesn't really make any sense. It doesn't have a chorus. You really need to work on it. It's like, oh my god, that's devastating. But by the time I got the critique, I had already recorded it, and I was totally in love with the song. So, you know, different strokes for different folks. It's exactly. Really all I can say but I guess it's just about I guess it's about love most of my songs are mm. about love it's like nobody taught you how to dance you don't you don't need to be taught how to do things sometimes just let it come naturally Ooh, I love that <laughs> I love that all right so let's listen to you never learned how to dance by Lil Carmen here we go it's a one step, it's a two step, it's a misstep, it's a waltz, one you don't know. It's a night, a night, a night, when you thought you might just go.
to Dance by Lo Carmen. That was beautiful. Oh, thank you. You know, I find it interesting that you sent this in and you got some critiques back on it. Isn't that always the thing? Like you create this beautiful piece of, of art and, you know, not everybody's going to love it. Well, that's right. But uh, I think that that particular uh, uh, songwriters association is very much geared towards having a big commercial hit. Mm -hmm. So I can completely oh, see absolutely. what they're saying. Oh, you absolutely. Know. You know, and it's, it's interesting because not everything is supposed to be a big commercial hit. No. And that's okay. Yeah. You know, like this song, I was like, oh, I could just hear this, see this being played at weddings, you know, for people's first dance. Like, it's so oh, sweet like and that. beautiful. Yeah. You know, and I just I just saw it in so many places. You know, you could see yourself at the beach and you're just hanging out, like listening. <laughs> it just it kind of took me away to that kind of beachy, you know, atmosphere. And I'm like, oh, you know, you're riding in the car with the top down. It just <laughs> <laughs> Great. You I know, love all those associations. Yeah. And, you know, music is very personal and it's very sensual and um i i just love the track i thought it was great so oh, thank you so much yeah yeah it's really cool and your new album when does it come out november 10th oh so we about are two weeks oh my gosh so you guys got to hear it first that yeah. is so cool yeah that's true that's a premiere Oh, <laughs> this was a premiere. Okay, we have to like do something special at the end because this is. <laughs> <laughs> I, I yes, cake, cake, <laughs> cake, and butter. Lots of butter. So much butter. <laughs> I love when we get to do uh, premieres and debuts. It's so much fun. It's so so much fun. So what's next for you? What's happening? You got the album coming out November tenth. Yeah. And uh, are we getting it in vinyl? Yes. All it's right. In vinyl. It's you can order it now. Okay. At, at Pledge Music. Ooh. which is, is another fantastic, you know, internet yes. thing. Yes, let's talk Things about that. We have internet. <laughs> I forgot about the pledge thing. Let's talk about that really, really quickly. We got a few more minutes. Let's okay, talk about... Okay, we can order the limited edition translucent blue Ooh. vinyl or digital. You can order um, handwritten lyrics. Ooh. Uh, a few other crazy little things. I can't remember now, but the vinyl's the most exciting thing yeah i love vinyl i love love vinyl yeah, it's, it's my first vinyl i'm really excited. oh my gosh i'm so psyched i wish we had a copy i know they're um, i know I they're coming out I soon i know they're it. coming no 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 <laughs> they're coming out soon so you guys as soon as i get my hands on one i'll make sure that i put it on the site so you can see it i like love 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 vinyl you guys I know will, that i will so send one into you this is so cool so talk to me really quickly we don't have yeah. much time but i want to before we wrap up i want to talk about the pledge campaign tell me how that was for you well, um, I probably wasn't that good at it, to be perfectly honest. Because <laughs> you're meant to send out a lot of emails. And yeah. I'm not very good at, you know, harassing my constituencies. So <laughs> <laughs> um, it, I mean, it's absolutely fine, but yeah. I, I, haven't, I haven't powered with it. Got it, got it. You know, it's really interesting. I love talking to people about their um, Kickstarter campaigns, their Pledge Music campaigns, because... You know, sometimes they're wildly successful and sometimes they're not. And, um, you know, I well, always you know, the thing about the pledge thing mm -hmm. is that I did it after making the album. So I wasn't trying to raise money. I was just using it as a vehicle for promotion. Oh, I love that. Yeah, that's what I like about it. too. Oh, that is really a good be, concept. Yeah, it's a it's a nice way to kind of get information out about mm -hmm. the album and to to have a place where people can connect yes. in wanting to get in there first yeah. and, and you know support the making of new music without um without it being I'm trying to reach a particular goal mm -hmm. so I didn't have a particular goal I was just trying to sell some albums before it was officially out I like that. I like that so much because that's a really different approach than I've ever heard before yeah. using it as a promotional tool instead of as just a fundraising tool. That's right. Well, I, I, I listen to a music business podcast. Mm -hmm. I'm very proud of myself. I've been doing yeah. that kind of thing. That's awesome. Uh, Whether people from Pledge said that they were hoping that within about a year, most artists would have a Pledge store the way they now have an Instagram account. Interesting. People sell all kinds of amazing and wonderful things on there they sell their guitars mm -hmm. you know you can mm -hmm. buy set lists um it's just kind of a way to engage with bands on a different level bands and artists i, I think it's going to be quite exciting and i just wanted to try it out and and get in there early 
That's really cool. And I love, love, love that you're using it as a promotional tool instead of fundraising because that's just a different approach. Mm. And it's very forward thinking, I think. Yeah, I've s- I mean, I've seen people on there selling their costumes that they wore mm. in a music video. Or I love that. Yeah. See, this is all the business stuff that I'm talking about, you know, different ways to get out there, different ways to engage with your community because your community is so important. And, you know, once you find the people that love what you do and, you know, they want to stick around, you want to keep them engaged and keep yeah. them happy. And, and that's so cool that you're doing that through Pledge Music, through providing vinyl and all kinds of little cool things that people can get that you can't get anywhere else. That's right. So that's really, really awesome. Well, look, Carmen, thank you so much for stopping by today. And, thank and you. If you could just tell everybody, how can they stay in contact with you? Well, I have Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. Uh, <laughs> it's all just at Low Carmen Music. And same, that's my website as well, lowcarmenmusic.com. I think that's it. Awesome. <laughs> lowcarmenmusic.com and on social everywhere at Low Carmen Music. All right. Well, thank you guys so much for tuning in today. And as you know, with Guitar Goddess, you can always find us at guitargoddess.com. If you like this episode, please be sure that you rate it. Let us know what you're liking, what you're digging. And you can find us all over the web. Facebook, Twitter, Twitter. I can't even talk. Twitter. Twitter. (laughs) Twitter. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat everything else at guitar goddess co so until next time you guys we will keep you updated on the happenings of low carmen and all the other goddesses and keep rocking you're listening to guitar goddess radio with azina only on la talk radio